It is good to sing of the goodness of God. Maybe you don't know this. That phrase, your goodness is running after me, comes right out of Psalm 23. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's good to sing that truth together. It's also good to proclaim the truth from God's word, and we're in a series on the Beatitudes called Kingdom Citizens. And so as a way of getting into our minds and hearts, we repeat this every week that we gather. So join with me. I'll read, and you can follow along and recite your part of the blessing and the Beatitudes from Matthew chapter 5. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. This is God's word to us. You may be seated. I have the privilege of introducing to you a friend of mine who's going to come and preach to you. you might, if you were here last week, you might be thinking, wait a minute, didn't you have a friend preach last week? Are you just going to have your friends do your job for you? Yeah, maybe, maybe. I've got great friends. Um, but uh, I, when, I, when Enoch King and his wife Chanel were going to be in town, I knew that I wanted you to hear from him. Uh, sometimes in life you think you're going to serve somebody and you find out you're the one that gets blessed. Uh, and that was true for me. You might laugh at this, but year, several years ago I went with a group of pastors in the middle of January to serve the Lord in St. Croix. Yes, I know. It was rough, rough calling. Um, and we went there to encourage some pastors and some churches, uh, and I got to know Enoch there. And uh, I, what I didn't know is that God was going to introduce me to a dear, dear brother in Christ and a, and a lifelong friend. And Enoch and Chanel have become very dear to my wife and I, and uh, we praise God for them. He pastors Way of the Cross Baptist Church on the island of St. Croix. He encourages and leads a network of churches in the Caribbean. Uh, he's an evangelist, but more than that, he's my friend, and he's your brother in Christ. And so join me in welcoming Pastor Enoch King. God bless you. Thank you so much, Pastor Jeff. Good morning, Chapel Street. Praise God. It's a joy to be here with you today. Truly blessed by the opportunity to share God's word with you. How many of you came ready to receive from God's word? Anybody? Amen. Amen. If you came ready to receive from God's word, can you do me a favor and just touch the person next to you and say, this is probably going to be the worst sermon you ever heard in your life. So, so give him grace. <laughs> Yes, as Pastor Jeff mentioned, I hail all the way from St. Croix, the Caribbean. How many of you ever been to St. Croix or the Virgin Islands before? Yeah, wow, amen, my people. Well, as you can tell, the weather is not like it is here, right? It's a lot sunnier. In, in fact, uh, a couple years ago, I met Pastor Jeff for the very first time, and what a joy he has been in my life. He and some other pastors, as you'll see in a little bit, they came to visit the island to share the love of God and also to audition for the new role in that movie called Aquaman. Anybody saw Aquaman before? <laughs> there he is, right there with them. And, you know, this is how it started, but after the first audition, um, you'll see what happened next. You see them running out of the water because it didn't go too well. Nevertheless, he being as wise as he is, he came back with backup and the real motivation that he needed. So what he did this time around was that he brought his beautiful wife, Erin, to visit us. And there you see, he turned in from a, a, a normal man into really and truly a real Aquaman. I took him into the ocean with me, and he was there fighting sharks. One time I was looking for him, and he was like, shark! It's like, no problem, I got this! (laughs) Not really, but I thank God for him. And beside him, his beautiful wife, Erin, they have been such a joy. How many of you know that your past is amazing? I'll tell you something. He's not just a pastor to you, but he's a pastor to pastors throughout the Caribbean. And his influence and his his love for us has really encouraged us in the ministry of the gospel. And I would be remiss if I did not introduce you my beautiful wife. She's standing there in the picture, but she's also here with us this morning. Babe, would you stand quickly? 
Amen. Yes, how did I get so lucky? God is a good God. Amen. But, um, you know, today I just wanted to say thank you to Chapel Street for your, your love and your support of our ministry in St. Croix. If you go to the next slide, you will see that over the past couple of years, you've poured into our lives through in different ways. And right there sitting on that table, a group of people that were disciple through the rooted ministry that Pastor Jeff introduced me to. And we took it back to our church and we have had over a hundred people to be discipled by this ministry so far. And you guys have been generous to us. You've been such a blessing. So give yourself a round of applause for supporting the work of the Caribbean. Amen. Well, if you don't mind standing one more time with me, because this way, I know you won't fall asleep on me, all right? <laughs> so we're going to be in the book of, we just read it, Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Let's say this one more time together. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Heavenly Father, by the power of your Son, Jesus Christ, today, I pray, O oh God, that your glory will be seen in this place. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us, O oh God. Every single person that came here, O oh God, with a receptive heart, speak to us now. Draw us all closer to you. In your mighty name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I was truly honored when Pastor Jeff asked me to share on this passage as I think about it now, I didn't really realize what I was getting into. I knew you guys had two services, but when I came here, he told me you had three. So praise God for how he's blessing your church and how he's working among you. So I got to pray that my legs are strong enough to maintain. Amen? Well, I know you've been delving into this for quite some time. And I won't waste your time and energy with going through all the context surrounding this passage here. But, you know, a couple of things that I, I still need to reiterate. And one is that the climax and, and the season of, that the people of God were going through, the children of Israel, was a really difficult time. They were religiously frustrated because they were constantly bombarded by the legalistic system that existed in their day and age. You see, there were a group of people called the Pharisees that made it almost impossible for them to uphold the law and to maintain the system of religion that existed. And what, what was so frustrating about it is that not only were they trapped religiously, but economically, they were going through a very difficult time financially. Because they were under the oppression of a very rigorous Roman Empire. And when they spend their days and nights and hours, they oftentimes would find themselves trapped. So trapped that when they looked to the left or the right, they seemed like there would be no hope on the horizon. But they heard of the promise throughout the ages that God said that he would send to them a Messiah. One who would free them, one who would liberate them. But they understood that to mean that he would free them basically from their physical bondage. But Jesus was more concerned about something a little deeper, the spiritual bondage to sin. So when he came on the scene and he began to preach and teach, obviously they were drawn to him as they followed him up on this mountaintop. And while he stood on the top, he began to declare to them the Beatitudes, which you've been going through. So I won't go back there and talk about it. But when he opened his mouth in this sentence, he said to them, Blessed are the pure in heart. And friends, you may not understand this, but this really shattered their hearts. Because... The message that they heard continually then was, blessed are those who are all about self. What they saw demonstrated from the Pharisees was an external evidence of being a follower of Christ. But really, internally, there was no true relationship with God. And this really frustrated them. And the people of God cried out for help. And when Jesus said to them, blessed are the pure in heart, he literally meant that Purity can only come from God. And I know this is difficult to understand because sometimes in our own selves, we think that we are good enough for God. In my own strength, in my own abilities, I believe that I could figure my life out. 
I've been there, I've done it, and it didn't work out very well. And I, I tell you something about them. They would do the same thing over and over, make the same mistakes over and over. It was like they were going in circles. And then they would turn around, just like we do today, and say, well, that was in my past. Anybody ever said that? It's okay. It's just a mistake. It was in my past. And yes, it was in my past. But the reality is that many of us are not struggling with our past. What we're really struggling with are patterns of unconfessed sin and patterns that hold us in bondage. So I don't know about you, but I learned quickly in life that I need to stop blaming things on my past and making it as an excuse and see the patterns that I'm, I'm, I'm allowing myself to be trapped in and then cry out to God for help. But they couldn't see this because here's why. They were more interested in a savior that would come their way and redeem them from the oppression that they were faced with physically. But Jesus didn't come to do that, as I said. He came to set the captives free. And when he said to them, blessed are the pure in heart, man, this ripped them in their soul. Because the frustration was that, how can we be pure when we're just sinners? The apostle Paul said, the things that I would like to do, I don't do it. And the things that I should not do, I find myself doing it. So in the spiritual life, we're continually trying to walk holy before God, and yet still, we're bombarded with temptation. You can't even turn on your TV without being tempted to sin. You can't even click online. You might be looking at a game. By the way, Lakers won last night. If you don't like it, I'm sorry for you. I'll be praying for you. I know y'all in Chicago, but Lakers is my team. Please don't stone me. <laughs> yes, did you see Bronny? Yes, pray for him. He need prayer, but all of us need prayer. But the people of God were in a season in their life where they needed help. And with a desperate heart, they climbed that mountainside, that hillside, hoping to hear the message that they wanted. Many times we miss God, just like they miss God, because he didn't come in the package we expected. We want God to come exactly how we need him to, to show up when we need him to, at the very moment, at a specific hour. And when he doesn't, we say, God, but you've forgotten me. God, you've forsaken me. Where are you, God, when I need you most? And have you ever said that to God? Why, God, aren't you here when I need you? But the Bible says one thing we can be sure of, God is a very present help in the time of trouble. He may not come when we need him, when we expect him to, but he always shows up on time. And the people of God knew with all their inner being that something was missing. And what it simply means is to be blessed has more to do with your position and being in the right standing with God rather than your financial status in life. We have been taught by this world to... How do I put it the best way? We have allowed ourselves to believe a big lie. You know what a lie is? I'm as good as what I've accomplished in this life. We base success on what we have and what we have done. You know, just look at my bank account. Just look at my accolades. Just look at my educational status. Just look what I've accomplished. Look what I've achieved. And we have told each other you're successful if you do this, if you do that. But you know what true success is in the eyes of God? Here's true success. To be living continually in obedience to God. True blessing is to be content in whatever state you find yourself. True blessing is to be led by the power of God, to be filled with the Spirit of God, to truly be enamored by the glory of God. So Jesus said to them, blessed are the pure in heart. And what he was saying there is, blessed are those who know me from the inside. Not just know of me externally. And why this is important to see is because the Pharisees spent most of their time working on their outward appearance. It was all, always about how they looked. You know, they were dressed in the best attire. They walked through the streets as if they were high and mighty, proud, full of, of their successes. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 5 to 8, even when they pray, 
They prayed in such a way that it was all about them. Let's go there. Verse 5 of Matthew 6 says, But when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogue and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard by their many words. Don't be like them, for your, fathers know, your father knows what you need before you ask him. They were praying to impress men. And friends, sometimes we do the same thing. We put our prayers on Facebook and we put our prayers on Twitter and all these good stuff saying, you know what, let me put it out there. Oh God, I'm praying to you, but are we praying to the God above or the God of social media? Many times we do things for the likes, for the, for the folks that will say to us, well done. Even as a church, and I've, I've had to tell our media team at church, let not, let's not do anything just for the praise of men. We don't need to be posting all that we're doing publicly so that people can say, look at you, what, look what you've done. No, God says when you give, here's what to do. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand do. When you give, give secretly. Give unto God in such a way. And God says when you do it, even when you pray, do privately. And when you pray privately, I will bless you publicly. But this world that we live in is all about your image. It's all about how I look on the outside. It's all about who sees me. It's all about the likes. It's all about the followers. And we have been chasing this big lie, believing that if they elevate me and if they love me and if they like me, then I'll be successful. But the thing about men is this. Men will love you today and hate you tomorrow. They will like you online and hate you. They'll hate you when they see you in person. Don't live your life for the praise of men, but live your life for the glory of God. And Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart. And this word pure here in the Greek means, is the word kateros. And what it refers to is simply this, to be cleansed from filth and all impurity. In other words, there are some things in us that need to be washed and washed clean. I don't know about you, but before I came to God, I was flooded with sin. I was bombarded with so many things in my life that needed to be transformed. And I couldn't do it on my own. And no matter how good you are today, or the good works that you've done, or all you've given and all you have served, the Bible says our works are like filthy rags. They're just not good enough. And that's hard to accept because as human beings, we want to believe that we're good enough for God. We want to believe that we are successful. We want to believe that God needs us. But the reality is God is God by himself. He's enthroned whether or not we allow him to be enthroned in our life. He's still going to be enthroned in this world. Mark chapter 7 reminds us that the Pharisees were so concerned about the external appearance that one day they walked up to Jesus and they said to Jesus, wait, why aren't your disciples washing their hands and cleaning themselves before they eat like we do? And Jesus said to them, listen, can I tell you in island style? <laughs> Jesus said to them, let me tell you something, why? What I mean is, let me tell you something, right? He said, listen, you guys on the outside, you act as if you have it all together, but in the inside, you are nothing but liars. You're nothing but hypocrites. You do all that you do so people can see you and people can praise you. And he even went a little further in verse 6 of, of, the, of that very passage says this. He said, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. But you leave the commandments of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said unto them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your own tradition. They were so focused on being critical of the true followers of Christ that they couldn't even see what they were doing. What I'd like to submit to you this morning is guard yourself 
from having a heart that is critical. A heart that's constantly trying to pick out the beam in your brother's eyes when you can't even see the own, I don't know what you call it, two by four piece of wood. Anybody know what a two by any construction workers in here? So for some of us, we want to see that little speck in somebody else's eye, but you know that two by four piece of wood? We can't see that in our own eyes. We can't see it in our own lives. Well, all we can see is, you know what, she should be doing this. And she said she was a Christian. Look at what she's doing. And you know, he's, he's supposed to be this, and look at what he's doing. And we condemn each other, not realizing that we ourselves are condemning our own selves. And Jesus said to them, be more concerned about the inward purity of your heart, because sin will contaminate and continue to contaminate your lives. I don't know about you, but um, I grew up in the Caribbean, as you know, on an island called Trinidad, to be specific, for some portion of my life. My dad traveled to Trinidad as a missionary to plant churches there. So we grew up all over the Caribbean. They kept moving as the Spirit of God would lead them. So while we were in Trinidad, we lived out in the countryside in an area called Carony. And Carony is an area known for the sugarcane plantations. How many of you ever had sugarcane before in your life? Amen. Was it good? Was it good? Uh oh, y'all don't sound too excited about sugarcane. <laughs> but I used to eat sugarcane until my jaws would get tired. And it's, I mean, it's the sweetest fr fruit you'll ever, you'll, ever, you'll ever taste. So we would be out there in the sugarcane fields all day, and the more sweet we took in, it's the thirstier we got. But next to the sugarcane plantations were also rice, rice fields. And if you ever see how they, they grow rice, basically they will open the floodgates of the river and they will allow the, the water to fill the field and they will plant the crop and they will leave it there for a season. And that water will stay there as long as it needs to be for the entire duration until it dries up. And as we got thirstier, spending much time out in the Caribbean sun, which is hot, by the way, amen? We got so thirsty one day that I said to myself, you know what, boy, I got to taste this. I got to drink some water. If I didn't get any water, I, I, would, I would pass out. And foolishly, I knelt down, scooped up some water and drank it. Because here's why. It looks so beautiful on the outside. It glistened in the sun. It looked so pure. The water was sparkling. It must be clean because of how it looks, right? And after I tasted it, Immediately, my stomach was upset, and I got sick for days. Why? Because I drank out of a fountain that was, wasn't truly pure. And this is how we are as Christians sometimes. We see the sin. We see the enticement. The Bible said the pleasures of this world look sweet. They look wonderful for a season. But after sin leads us to the path of death, the Bible said it's a way that seems right unto a man. But the end leads to destruction. And that was me before God. Sometimes we struggle because of contamination. And the psalmist, understanding this, he said, But who shall ascend into the hill of God? Who can stand in his holy place? He said, Only he that has clean hands and a pure heart who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. This is the only person that be able to stand in the kingdom of God. And when I think of that, I realize that I will never be good enough for God. How do I feel that I am? I am not. I'm not holy enough. I'm not righteous enough. Newsflash, none of us are. And the psalmist looking towards Jerusalem. I could picture him walking up that hill and seeing and say, who can stand there? Who can be good enough for God? And the reality as we think about this is that there is none righteous, no, not one. Somebody has to atone for the sins of this world. And God understanding that realized that there needed to be a bridge between God and man because our sin has separated us from God. Every evil thought, every evil deed, every desire that we have done, every disobedient act that we have committed have literally built a wedge between us and God. And God said in grace, I need to build a bridge back to me, but still God being 100% holy has to be just, and he has to punish sin. 
So he being a holy God said, okay, I have to punish sin. But since they can't do it on their own, I'm going to provide a sacrifice for their sins. The Bible says, for God so loved this world, he gave his only son. He knowing that we needed mercy, he knowing that we needed grace, and he yet being a holy God, having to do what he did, he sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross of Calvary for my sin, for your sin, and for the sins of the entire world. And when I think about that, I say, man, God, how much I don't deserve your grace. God, how much I don't deserve your love. God, how much you have been good to me. And as Jesus took my cross and he took my shame, he took my whips, he took my pain. There on the cross of Calvary, he shouted from the top of his voice when he was finished, it is finished. Te telestai in Greek, meaning I'm done, Father. I've paid the portion for their sins. I am their propitiation. I am the one, their father, that now when you see them, I want you to see me instead of them. Here's why. Because I die shedding my blood for their sins. And the father, who's 100% holy, accepted the son's sacrifice as his righteous requirement and payment for our sins. And friends, to be pure in heart means to be positioned so meticulously that you are in the right relationship with God. How? Through the imputed righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. And all that simply means is this. God takes his righteousness. Jesus took his righteousness and he clothed us with his righteousness. So now when we sin and the Father sees our sin, the Father sees Christ in us. And that is beautiful. You know why? Because in my own ability, in your own ability, you will never be able to reach the righteous requirements for God. But on the cross, Jesus paid it all. The songwriter said, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe sin. Has left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. So we've been positionally cleansed in Christ because of his work on the cross of Calvary. But not just that. There's a practical part to our purity now that has to be lived out. Yes, we're saved. Yes, we're forgiven. But I don't know about you. There's some things in our life that we have to bring under subjection. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God. And as we are becoming the righteousness of God, we now have to walk through the process of sanctification. And all that simply means is that God is purging us daily as a believer in Christ. He's cleansing us. He's bringing to light every area of our life that needs to be submitted to his glory. I liken this to something that occurred in my life a couple years ago. As I mentioned, my beautiful wife is here with me today, and I'm so excited about that. But when we first got married, man, it was an interesting season. It was so interesting because she moved in. Of course, I invited her in, and this is the love of my life. Come on in, baby. And she came in. And after a couple of days, she began to say, babe, you know, I love to cook and everything. Not me. She loves to cook. Thank God for her. How many of you men have good women who love to cook for you? I'm a greedy man, so I thank God for my woman that loves to cook. Amen? Anyways, she moved in and said, babe, can we, can we work on the kitchen? The kitchen needs a little work. I said, okay. I said, what would you like done? She said, okay, can we, can we paint the cabinets? It's old. I said, all right, fine. So I got paint, began to paint the cabinets. And then she said, ah, you know, I think the countertops need to change too. I was like, okay, yeah, we, we, we could do that. You know, trying to be a good husband, trying to stay married. Any of you men ever tried to stay married? <laughs> All right. She said, okay, yeah. And she said, ah, okay, the countertops need to change. And she said, you know, now that the countertop is changed and, and, the, and the cabinets are painted, how about we change the flooring because it just don't match anymore. I was like, I see where this is going. 
It moved from flooring to lights to fixtures to all this stuff. And, and before you knew it, it was a full-fledged renovation. So I got the kitchen done. I was like, okay, thank God. The kitchen is done. Baby, look good, right? And then she was like, well, you know what? I have some family visiting, you know, so I think the guest bedroom needs to be cleaned out. So we started cleaning, and she's like, oh, babe, maybe we should paint the walls. And while you had to change the flooring and the fixtures and the lights and everything else, and I was like, oh. But I did it because I wanted to what? Stay married. <laughs> Fast forward, room by room, she went through till she got to our room. I don't know why she left our room for last, but she said, okay, since we're here, can we, um, like, you know, just, again, change the flooring, <laughs> the fans, the fixtures, everything else. And then she got to the closet. She opened the door and she said, babe, you got to do something about this closet. I said, my closet? You have the whole house. <laughs> and in, in, in Antigua, we don't say little, we say little, all right? Which means little. I said, you have the whole house and this little sub and I have it, this small little closet that I have. You want that too? And she's like, babe, it's a mess. Look at the closet. She even pulled out pants that I had in high school. You know those baggy pants? <laughs> I graduated from high school since 2020. So, I'm sorry, 2000. So you understand how long ago that was. But back then we had baggy pants and now it come, it's, it's come back into style now. And she made me throw away all my baggy pants, by the way. So she began to clean out the closet section by section, um, renovate the floor and everything, everything. And then when she was done, she said, babe, no, this house is a home. Ah, but isn't that true of God in the same way? That when we invite him by faith, when we gaze upon Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and we invite him into our lives to be Lord, he moves in and he says, Time to clean up. Practical purity. Time to make the changes in your life. And he comes into our heart. And we say, okay, Jesus, you're welcome in my living room. You can be here with me. Yes, Jesus. Yeah, you can use the bathroom. Yes, Jesus. You can use the kitchen. Yes, Jesus. Ah, I'm going to allow you to come in my bedroom, but just for a second, Jesus. Yes, my bedroom. You can come for a second after he pushes and the Holy Spirit leads and the Holy Spirit directs. And then he gets to the closet. And we say, Jesus... You can have everything, but leave my closet alone. Jesus, just, can I be a little bit good and a little bit bad at the same time? Is it okay that I could serve you 99.9% .9 and just leave that 1%? Jesus, is it okay if you allow me to just have those negative thoughts and be unforgiving and, and not be merciful to my brother and not be compassionate and not hunger and thirst after righteousness? Is it okay, Jesus, if I could just have a little bit of selfishness? Is it okay? And Jesus speaks into my spirit and he says, Enoch, unless I don't have your closet, I don't have you. So if you can't surrender your closet to me, then you're really not truly surrendered to me. And this is the same thing he's saying to us today. It's not how much you've already given to him. It's what is left unsurrendered in our life? What we need to submit to God? Because it's not just to be good enough to be positionally pure in Christ, but practically we are asked to walk this out. Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice which is holy and acceptable unto God. And this is your reasonable form of worship. And then he said to them, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. What God is referring here, the cleansing and the purity is not the mind, the muscle. Not the heart, the muscle, sorry. But the heart, the mind. The part of us that is deep. The part of us that we think with and we act with and we know with and we make decisions with. God is saying, I need your heart of hearts. Someone said, the real problem with us and the real problem with the human beings is simply a problem of the heart. The heart of the problem is a problem of the heart. And could you imagine, imagine how the, the Pharisees felt that day when Jesus would say to them, 
you need to be pure in your heart when everything they did was to appear good externally. It's only when we are pure in our heart do we really see things the way God wants us to. The latter part of this verse says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You know, when the vision of our hearts is awakened to the glory of God, and when we by faith clean out our closet, and when we allow the Spirit of God to fill our lives, then we begin to see God at work in our lives. Sin blinds our vision from seeing God enthroned in our life. But the more pure our heart is, is the better we begin to see God in all of his glory. And the psalmist said here, listen, I, I want to see God. I want to see God. I want to know God. And Jesus said to them, you need to be pure in your heart so that you can see me in this life. Otherwise, all you will see is your problems. You will see your pain. All you will see is your trials. All you will see is your sickness. All you will see is your difficulties. But how many of you know that God brings problems and trials and tribulations into our lives to remind us that he is greater than they are? So in the midst of your struggle today, and I understand life is tough, and I understand things get difficult, but I want you to begin to focus your gaze, as the Bible says, set your affection on things above and not on things of this earth, because everything in this world is just temporary. We're going to leave it all behind. And Jesus said to them, listen, can you see God in your life? Can you see him in the midst of it all? Because right now, they wanted back then, Moses wanted to see God. All the men of old said, God, show me your face. Show me your glory. God, show me who you are. But you know what? They can never see God in his true beauty and splendor because none of us are righteous enough to see God in this world. But one of these days in the kingdom to come will ultimately be pure and we will see God for who he really is enthroned above every other, Lord above every other, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And why this is so exciting for me to know is that the kingdom belongs to those who are pure in heart and those who see God daily in their life, those who look for God. Friends, God desires to know you, and know you intimately. Many of us are far more concerned about who is going to be enthroned in a couple of weeks in the United States of America. But I wonder how concerned are we about who is enthroned in our hearts. If you look for God, the Bible says you will seek him and find him when you have searched for him with all your heart. You know, as I bring this message to a conclusion, I can't help to recall that a couple of years ago, I was doing a mission trip in the DR, Dominican Republic. Any of you ever been to the DR before? Amen. Beautiful place. And I was led by a host downtown, and he took me to the port where Christopher Columbus would sail from England, and he would bring the slaves there, and where they would auction them off for the rest of the, the island. And when he got there... He took me to this cell that was not very large. It was about 10 by 10. And all the, the slaves who got sick on the journey, who were feeble, who were weak, they would take them and they would throw them in this cell. And they would leave them there to die. And this went on for some time until a Franciscan priest came by. And God moved upon his heart, and he said to them, why are you allowing these people to die? Why don't you just set them free? And they say, I'm not going to set them free unless somebody pay the price. They were willing to see them die rather than just let them go. And the Spirit of God began to move on this Francis Franciscan priest, and he said to them, listen, I will pay for them. He got all the pennies that he got together and he came there. And one by one, the feeble, weak, the marred, those who were broken, broken limbs, broken body parts, he would pay for their freedom. And then he'd do something so amazing. He would lead them to the city through a little hole in the wall. 
And he said, now that I've paid for you, I'm giving you the opportunity to go free. He'll grant them their papers. He'll say, this is the door. You can go through it. And every single one of those hundreds of slaves that he ransomed would turn around and say, hey, because you ransom us, we choose to serve you. Although they got their freedom, they understood that there was no freedom without him. And they pledged their lives to live in such a way that they will honor him. How much more so us understanding that Jesus came into this world to ransom our soul. He paid the price that we can never pay. He died the debt that we can never die. And still the Bible says he did not die. But on the third day he rose from the dead. And one of these days he's coming back. I wonder my friend today, do you know this Jesus? Have you accepted his gift that he has given to you? Have you honestly realized that the purity that he speaks of here is only to be found in a relationship with him? The last thing our host in the DR said to me was this. You see that carving in the wall? You know why it's still there? Because today we refer to it as the mercy door. That's such a beautiful story because Jesus said, I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I will give my life for my sheep. This morning, maybe you have gone so far from God that you are strayed, just like the children of Israel. And you know what? The sad thing about this was that even though Jesus never rose to presidency, even though he was never elected, the Bible says God saw fit to enthrone him. And God gave him a name above every other name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he's Lord to the glory of God. Sometimes we look for salvation through men, but we already have a savior. So come in the next couple of weeks, it doesn't matter who's enthroned on this world. I invite you to know for sure who is Lord and enthroned in your heart. Allow Jesus Christ into your life. And friends, when he comes in, he'll make sure that your closet is totally clean. Would you bow your head and hearts with me today? Spirit of God, I thank you. I thank you for the privilege we have today, dear God, to spend time in your word. Oh, God. Just like you have spoken to me in times before, I know you're still speaking today. Father, if there's anyone who do not know you as Lord and Savior, Spirit of the living God, would you draw them to yourself? God, someone today needs forgiveness from their sins. Someone today, their God, needs to be cleansed. Someone needs to be saved. Oh, Jesus, Son of the living God, would you save them today, their God? Jesus said, all that come unto me, I will in no wise cast out. I wonder this morning if you're here and you've Never ask Jesus into your heart. Maybe you've been coming to this church for a long time. Maybe you're a member of this church. Maybe you give and maybe you serve and that's great. But can I ask you, do you know Jesus? All the Jews on that day, they heard the message of salvation. They heard the message of hope, but they still walked away and they rejected Jesus as their Messiah. I wonder today, what will you do with Jesus? All you have to do right where you are is open up your heart and say, Jesus, I receive you. I'm grateful for your sacrifice for my sins. I'm grateful that you bled on the cross of Calvary. Because of what you did, I now place by faith my life in your hand. I believe that you are the Son of God. And if you would invite him into your heart, 
He'll come in and save you. God bless you. I'll be thinking about that uh, phrase of Jesus. If I don't have your closet, I don't have you for a long time. And in the song we just sang, Give Me Jesus. And the great thing is he, he's ready to answer that prayer. And if you prayed it a moment ago with Enoch, I just want to invite you to come forward, talk to us, go to the back of the prayer room, talk to somebody there. We want to encourage you through prayer. Now receive the benediction this morning. Brothers and sisters, may the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit and the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you always, now and forever. Amen. And go in his peace.